Good evening. On behalf of the Jefferson Madison Regional Library, I would like to welcome you to tonight's program, which is the Forgotten History of Penn Park. Uh, my name is Maureen Spokes, and I am a reference librarian at Northside Library. Two things before we get started. I wanted to let you know that uh, we will be recording the first part of this program, and it will be made available on the library's YouTube channel. Also, we're asking you to hold your questions until the end. There'll be a, a period where you could uh, make comments or ask questions at the end of the program. And um, so now it is my honor and privilege to introduce our panelists. So on the far right is Jeff Werner. He's the Historic Preservation and Design Planner for the City of Charlottesville. Then we have in the middle, Benjamin Ford. He's an archeologist and a principal investigator for Ravana Archeological Services. And then at the other end is Tom Chapman. He's the executive director of the Albemarle Charlottesville Historical Society. So thank you for being with us. So, um, so thank you and uh, a good evening. Um, and I first, I just wanna thank the library for inviting us to speak tonight. Uh, especially want to thank you, Maureen. Um, Maureen and I actually met about a year ago uh, at the cemetery and somewhat by accident. Uh, and she's long been interested in this, uh, in this site out there. And so that chance meeting uh, is what led us to being here tonight. And, and so thank you very much. So again, I'm Jeff Werner. I'm the city of Charlottesville's uh, historic preservation and design planner. Um, <coughs> just quickly last summer using ground penetrating radar and you'll hear us refer to GPR. Uh, we examined an area outside the cemetery at Penn Park, and the evidence suggests the possibility of over 40 unmarked, unknown graves, uh, and we suspect that they are most likely the graves of individuals who had been enslaved at Penn Park. So tonight, I, I'm going to first talk about uh, the origin of Penn Park, uh, the cemetery there, and, and what was revealed in the GPR work uh, to offer the sort of the context of the discussion. And then, then next, Ben Ford with Ravana Archaeological Services, uh, it's going to talk about the examination of the site and um, and how it was conducted. And then Tom Chapman with um, the Outmark Charlottesville Historical Society, um, he's going to talk about his experience when he was working in Montpelier uh, on the slave cemetery uh, uh, work there, and on also the current efforts um, that he's working to help us, uh, uh, that would be me at the city, help us identify who might be buried at Penn Park, and 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 we hope with that to, to identify then um, and be able to contact some of the possible descendants. So, um, so after we've, um, so I'm sorry. Uh, after we speak, uh, then we're going to. Uh, there'll be plenty of time for uh, for questions, and, and we certainly encourage them. But most, really, what we really want to hear from or hope to reach out to tonight is is folks who this story may fit something in their uh, family narrative. Uh, something sounds familiar. Uh, this is really part of the outreach effort to 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 help us identify you know, who might be out there and, and who their descendants might be. So, so with that, um, and I'll go to the first slide. Uh, so uh, Penn Park, uh, as we know it today, um, is, and you can go down to the, the, to the first map. And, but Penn Park, as we know it today, it's, uh, uh, and this is the original uh, land owned, and you can go to the next slide. Okay. Uh, the original 430 acres owned by Dr. George Gilmer, and then the next one. So what you see here is uh, that's the 280 acre park uh, that the city owns. And But the name actually comes from uh, Dr. George Gilmer. His family owned the property from 1786 until 1812. And, and it was, again, originally a 430 acre uh, parcel. And the name Penn Park comes from an estate in England. Um, then you can go to the next slide. So in the summer of 2019, I was contacted by a descendant of Dr. Gilmer uh, who had asked about the maintenance of the cemetery. And again, the cemetery is located within a city park and it is on city property. Um, but I had to admit to them, I, I didn't know anything about it because I, I was not aware that there was even a cemetery there. So, um, so I went out there to see it for myself. And so you can see here, the cemetery is located, um, it's about, in the southeast corner of the park, that's the Rivanna River uh, there in the, the blue. Um, and it's a, the cemetery is about 800 feet 
uh, southeast of the clubhouse, which is actually where the original uh, Penn Park house was located. And you can flip the slide. So that's the house that was there. And then there's another slide. Um, so now we're at, this is the cemetery. And um, the cemetery in the image you're looking at is uh, north is at the top. And it it's, uh, consists of three enclosed family plots. So the next slide. So um, go one more. And so the brick uh, at the north end, this is the Gilmer plot. Um, and that's the date that their family occupied. Uh, now there are graves in there that date after that, but that's the period that the uh, Gilmers occupied the property. The next slide, and this shows the uh, Craven family section, which is uh, they own Penn Park between 1819 and 1845. And that's within a field stone wall. And then finally, at the southern end, flip is this is the Hotop family uh, section. Uh, they were German immigrants who um, owned the property between 1866 and 1905, and their uh, uh, plot is surrounded by a, a, an ornate iron fence. And um, just since 1733, we know that over a dozen families have owned this property. However, only these three uh, that we know of uh, establishes. A family cemeteries at the park. And so I say, I have a lot of experience with old cemeteries and burial sites. And, and while I was walking the site, and you can go to the next uh, slide. So this is looking at the, the east wall of, uh, or the east boundary of the three uh, family plots. Hotop there on the left, Craven in the middle, and uh, uh, Gilmer at the top with the brick. And what's important to point out here is that from where I'm standing, the entrances into the family plots, the Hotops comes in from the bottom, the Craven and Gilmer enters on the opposite side. But when I was walking outside on this side, uh, I noticed several depressions along the wall, particularly along the Craven section. Uh, they were all oriented east-west, and they appeared to be in, in two rows. And in fact, in the next slide, um, so this is looking down from the Gilmer, sort of looking along that wall that I'm speaking of. And in the next image, this is this is actually a picture I took and added the, the, the markings. This is what I sent to Ben uh, back in 2019 when I asked him to go out there and look. And it's and it's difficult to communicate the depressions in a photograph, but but this is what I saw. And um, and then I went Ben and and some colleagues from his firm went out there that the, I asked them what they thought, and they observed this at surface evidence that was suggested the possibility of graves. And so from that. I asked uh, Ravana to uh, develop an evaluation plan, which they did, and we got funding for it. And and then COVID hit, and so we I think it took us almost eight months until we were finally able to get out there and do the work. And it was on a uh, finally on a, a brutally hot July morning. Um, ben and a team from Neva Geophysics um, uh, they came out and they used ground penetrating radar, GPR, to examine an area around the cemetery, and, and this is around it being outside of the family plots. And again, that evidence suggests there might be an excess of 40 unknown, unmarked graves outside the walls, and um, importantly located along the east walls, which I said do not, you know, they don't have entrances into the family plots. And so that and other evidence suggests these are most likely the graves of individuals who had been enslaved at Penn Park. So let's walk through um, what we know. So again, here's the cemetery, North is at the top. Um, we have the Gilmer section where uh, we believe there are seven, uh, between seven and 16 graves. Um, then the next is the Craven section. We know that there are 14 uh, burials in there. And then at the bottom is the Hotop section with between 14 and 18 uh, burials. So the next slide, you see in these three family plots, uh, 35 to 48 graves. And then you go outside the plots, and this is what was found. Now, um, we have another image from Neva, but I, I, I just to sort of simplify things, um, uh, put these uh, in these markings. And But you can see that. Um, Roughly three rows. Um, they are aligned uh, east-west, uh, indicative of a burial. And um, but also stress that the the length or thickness of these lines doesn't indicate anything. It just sort of um, how they came out when I was working on it. And so, and go to the next slide. So now we have this site where you know we originally been looking at three family, three small family cemeteries. 
Uh, and now we have substantially larger burial site with possibly more than 80 graves. And in fact, the red line that's on the, uh, on the side of uh, the image here, it roughly corresponds to a, a, an uncultivated area that's visible even in, in old uh, 1930s aerial photographs. So we have some suspicion there was a reason that wasn't, um, that area wasn't disturbed. So it's possible that there are additional graves in that area at, at, due to their aging conditions, simply uh, the GPR could not detect them. And so that's what we found. I, I, we also did um, prepared some videos that I think really show the relationship of these unmarked graves outside the walls and, and the graves within the family plots. And, and we did some overhead video using a drone and um, it, I, I think, it more powerfully expresses what's going on out there. And, and, and before we show it, I, I do have to uh, thank my friend Drew Kraft uh, for his expert drone piloting. It was a, it was a windy day, and, but these uh, really remarkable images. So um, using GPR, I went out there, or using the map from the GPR evidence, I went out and I laid sheets of paper down. Um, and then I had to weigh them down with stones because it turned out being windy, but uh, laid out where the, generally where the unmarked graves were. So this first video that we're gonna show, it starts at that top left-hand corner, the Northwest corner, and then flies sort of diagonally across. It's, it's flying east towards the, uh, the river. So if you can show that. Um, you might have to go to the next slide. Oh, oh up back. You know what I may have done? I may have some folk, I may have, um, still images in there. So you can go forward too. And let's see what you get. It's the next one, isn't it? Should we, yeah, probably the next slide. All right, that's it. Is that a video? Yep. All right. So yeah, here you're looking at the Gilmer section uh, there's one possible barrier there in, in the corner, uh, a little curious about that. But then you fly over, you see the craven in the middle, and you begin to see the, 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 the these likely graves aligned um, outside the walls. And the next video, uh, there's two of them, uh, show this uh, the relationship um, of the graves from coming from the, and this is the same one from the northwest corner, but these we're looking down at the corner uh, of the um, Hotop family uh, section. So your north is to the top and there's Drew piloting and looking up. And, um, but so you, you get the sense of the inside and outside of you know, a very uh, you know, ornate burial site with headstones and these large tablets and, and outside, remember the, uh, nobody knew that these were there except you know, for us putting down uh, these sheets of paper. And then the last video um, is again, just sort of flying along the wall. Uh, again, I, to me, it, it just sort of offers that striking contrast of, of, of you know, what's going on at this site. And, uh, you know, on the left, we have the known and on the right, we have the unknown. And I think that's the challenge before us is to, to, to find a way to, to give voice to these individuals there. And, and that's, that's what we're here tonight to talk about. So, so that's um, the images that I have. You can go to the last image, which is just uh, sort of, yeah, just a placeholder. I just wanna say, you know, um, so we're here tonight for several reasons, um, but maybe the most important goal again is to continue to publicize the story and, and hope that people hear it and realize it, it matches something they're familiar with. Um, and I say, we don't know who might be buried in these graves. Uh, we have a few clues. We have, um, we have some guesses and we have some threads that we're pulling at, but but we really need the community's help. And uh, last November, I presented these findings to city council. Uh, and while the area uh, has been roped off to prevent people from driving the golf carts on this ground, in fact, that's the 14th hole uh, to the right. And you can see the rope uh, that's put down. Um, a decision was made uh, to, to not add any memorial, memorials or markings to this site um, because they we want to, involve the families and we want to involve the descendants. And so uh, these graves, they're, they are their family plots and, and we want their input on how to treat these graves and, 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 and we want to treat them appropriately and with respect. So 
So if this story fits your family story, and the one slide, if it, if it sounds familiar, if there's something in this or uh, it has a piece that you can add to it, that's how you can contact me. And I, I look forward to hearing from you. And, and so that's what we found. I'm gonna hand it off here to Ben to talk about uh, how we did what we did. And um, all yours, Ben. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I'm gonna pick up uh, where Jeff left off. Um, after he had seen the unusual depressions, he, he uh, called uh, myself and my colleagues out to uh, take a look at them. And um, we uh, did indeed uh, confirm and um, uh, notice the same depressions that he did. And I, and I believe there were about eight, what I would call uh, reasonably good depressions and maybe a few more that were possible uh, grave shaft depressions. And um, clearly, uh, immediately, uh, we thought that the, they were possible human interments. First slide, please. So at that point, uh, because there were only a few shallow depressions, um, we believe there were two possible explanations. Uh, as we've learned in our research, uh, sometimes cemetery enclosures such as walls uh, fall down and get rebuilt all the time and they don't always get built in the same place. So enclosures sometimes move, oftentimes leaving interments outside. Uh, and likewise, shallow depressions uh, are also formed by tree falls and tree removal, et cetera. Uh, the, other, the other explanation is that uh, they could, in fact, be the graves of enslaved African Americans who lived and worked on the Penn Park property. Uh, so as Jeff mentioned, we teamed up and submitted a proposal to the city of Charlottesville we teamed up with uh, NAVA Geophysics, a Charlottesville-based consultant, and we proposed a uh, two-phased research design. Uh, stage one was a non-invasive ground-penetrating radar or GPR survey of the area immediately surrounding the park cemetery. Next slide. And that's that highlighted uh, blue area there. Um, and uh, GPR is a very particular uh, form of survey. It works best in well-drained sandy soils, uh, in areas of low interference, uh, in other words, power lines, sometimes bedrock can interfere with the reception. Uh, and it also works well in dry conditions. Um, we've had reasonable success here, uh, working with NAVA in Central Virginia in historic cemeteries and uh, locating individual interments and delineating uh, the extent of burial grounds. Next slide. Uh, the second phase of the research we proposed was to uh, ground truth uh, one or two of the uh, depressions, surface depressions, to verify exactly what they were, uh, it, whether they were human interments or whether they were something else of a natural or cultural explanation. Um, as I will detail later, it was not unusual for uh, us to encounter a GPR located feature that required subsequent identification. Um, this particular slide is an image from another cemetery where we worked, uh, where we removed the topsoil, the top six to 10 inches of soil to come down on that interface between topsoil and subsoil. And what you see in the slide here, that darker red rectangular shape is the top of a grave shaft. Uh, so that's what we were talking about for the phase two ground truthing is removing uh, the top few inches of soil coming down onto the top of what would have been a grave shaft or if it was another cultural feature or natural feature, uh, identifying it uh, as well. Next slide, please. Uh, so what is GPR? Um, this is an image of, of NAVA consultants out at Penn Park Cemetery. Um, GPR utilizes high frequency electromagnetic energy uh, to image objects below ground. Uh, GPR machine pictured here is uh, run over a project area and an electromagnetic pulse is emitted, which travels through the ground and is reflected upon encountering materials with differing electrical properties. Um, and what we call 
GPR anomalies are identified in the soils based on these differing electrical properties when compared to the surrounding natural soil. So GPR can identify solid objects below grade, let's say masonry foundations, an old house foundation, an historic utility, uh, as well as the disturbances made by them. Uh, in a graveyard or cemetery context, it can also identify grave shafts and other disturbed cultural contexts. And the, the uh, physics here is that these disturbed soils generally contain moister soils than the surrounding undisturbed soils. And moister soils uh, possess a higher electrical conductivity than drier soils. Um, however, some graves, the older they get, um, do deteriorate over time in terms of the soils they contain possessing less moisture, and they begin to resemble the surrounding natural soils, making it difficult to, to identify. So GPR is not a perfect science, um, but it works well in many conditions. Next image, please. So uh, when a GPR machine is run over uh, a cemetery, the uh, anomalies that they see and that can be understood in the field uh, can only be understood generally. There is no large TV screen that shows a clear and concise image of what is buried below ground. Um, anomalies, whether it be a tree planting hole or a, a grave show up as a blip, a concave uh, parabola. Next image, please. So here's a, a slide which shows uh, essentially what a, a grave uh, shaft might look like uh, on a GPR screen. Uh, the top orange uh, portion of the slide is a, a schematic drawing of a grave shaft with a coffin in it. And then the bottom uh, uh, image is what the GPR machine would see when it runs over that. Um, so within an historic cemetery, um, GPR covers as completely as possible the entire project area uh, through close interval, generally half meter or less, uh, north-south oriented transects. Next image, please. Uh, here, here are some other uh, images of uh, potential graves. Excuse me. Those are Penn Park. And, yeah, thank you, Jeff. Uh, taken from Penn Park. So the top image shows a uh, uh, parabola or upside down U-shaped image, uh, which is uh, what we believe is a grave potential grave shaft. And then the bottom image shows three with the blue dots being uh, the top of that uh, uh, area of interest, the anomaly, um, but three right side by side next to each other. <coughs> next slide, please. Um, so when we're running through a cemetery, we have these north-south oriented transects. Uh, they're chosen to be perpendicular to the long axis of most traditional uh, Christian burials, which are oriented east-west more often than not. And when you run perpendicular to it, you're going to be enhancing the potential for their identification. So this is an image, uh, both the left and the right image, produced by NAVA Geophysics. Uh, and the relative size, uh, shape, and depth of the GPR anomalies can be seen through mapping. Uh, so the image on the left is what we call a slice, a horizontal slice of what the uh, GPR machine sees, but it's mapped out. And the uh, yellow and red colors show uh, uh, anomalies. Uh, uh, in this particular image on the left, uh, the cemetery is the uh, rough rectangular shape in the middle, uh, north is to the top, and the yellow and red areas are uh, uh, grave or anomalies that are potential grave shafts. Um, so uh, when we map this out, uh, we take into account the general size, the orientation of the anomaly, and the depth of the anomaly by looking at these GPR slices, which come in inches uh, down to six or seven feet. Um, and the grave shafts uh, generally appear as oblong or rectangular shaped features occurring at regular intervals uh, in rows and in clusters. 
And then the image on the right is uh, our interpretation of which of those anomalies are actual grave shafts and their location and orientation. So uh, using the actual mapped GPR data from the left, we can then uh, create this map on the right, which interprets that data. Next image, please. So this is the video. Okay, uh, so this, uh, this is the video uh, uh, that will show the depth slices through time. Is that yeah, correct? It's very quick, uh, but it just to sort of show what the GPR folks were looking at. And it's, uh, I could say it's, 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 it's not the easiest to interpret, but it, uh, I think it expresses some of the, you know, the complexity of, of, of this, the way this was done. So, but it's a series of, right, the, 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 each depth measurement. And so, they kind of took those slices and then uh, they created this was kind of a low uh, uh, res version, but uh, to just show how the, the layers kind of going back up, you know, going down and then coming back up, how they reassembled that, that data to, to, to indicate where um, these interpreted uh, burials were. So you can begin to see that there, but uh, that's, that's why I thought this was helpful. So great. And then next slide, please. So uh, as Jeff mentioned, um, this is a, a, a naval geophysics image. Um, this, uh, the, the survey identified a total of 43 potential grave shafts uh, outside of and surrounding the Penn Park Cemetery enclosure. Uh, they were predominantly located along the east side of the walled cemetery in what appear to be three rows, as you can see in the image. Um, we are not, uh, entirely uh, sure that this is all of the graves that are there and that it is entirely possible, uh, as Jeff mentioned previously, that there are more possibly additional graves uh, that were not identified by the GPR survey. Um, because it was clear that the surface indications and the GPR findings documented an historic period cemetery, and they were not the result of other natural or cultural disturbances, uh, it was decided to abandon um, the stage two ground truthing or removing topsoil. We felt that there was enough substantial and convincing evidence that we did in fact have more historic interments here. So some preliminary information we can get from looking at this uh, image, uh, the arrangement uh, of the graves adjacent to the cemetery enclosure, uh, as I mentioned, appears in distinct rows. Uh, some of the GPR uh, identified graves overlap with the potential grave shafts that we had identified during our site visit early on. Uh, however, most of the GPR identified graves were not visible uh, on the ground surface. So in this graphic, um, the yellow uh, graves are uh, surface depressions uh, that were also identified by GPR, uh, and the blue were surface depressions only that the GPR did not pick up on, and the pink, uh, the majority of the grave shafts there were GPR identified grave shafts. Most of the GPR identified graves uh, are located to the rear or east side of the cemetery, and as Jeff mentioned, that uh, is the uh, rear of the cemetery as defined by the entrance gates, but also an upslope downslope relationship. Uh, lastly, uh, the big question, uh, who is buried in these graves? Um, we came to a few conclusions that I will pass on to you. Um, the significant number of interments, in our opinion, suggested that they represented a large population of individuals interred over a long period of time, uh, and that they do not, uh, in fact, represent a stray grave from a Gilmer, uh, Craven, or Hotop burial. Uh, we felt that the chances of 43 individuals from prominent white families, uh, the chances that they would be buried outside of the cemetery without markers and lacking burial records uh, just did not make sense to us. So given the deep history of the Penn Park property, and its pre-emancipation association with slave-based agriculture, we determined that the 43 individuals buried outside the cemetery uh, most likely had to represent an enslaved population. Um, 
we, we do know that historical records in the form of uh, personal property tax records, uh, chancery cases, uh, and of course, US census records document a very large enslaved population that was owned by the Gilmer and Craven families between the late 18th uh, through the mid 1840s. Um, we also know, uh, just as they were in life, most whites and blacks uh, were segregated in death, particularly during a pre-emancipation period. Um, however, there is no typical uh, arrangement when it comes uh, for burials for white owners and enslaved African Americans in Virginia, or even the larger South. Uh, enslaved African American graves uh, are found buried in distinct cemeteries distant from one another, uh, outside of and adjacent to white cemeteries, or even within the same cemetery. Um, at the University of Virginia, the enslaved uh, burial ground there, uh, we know that enslaved African-Americans were buried outside of and adjacent to the white university uh, cemetery. So it's a very similar example here at Penn Park. Um, likewise, uh, the owners of Penn Park in the post-emancipation period, the Hotop family, uh, employed uh, several African-American families who lived and worked on the property for several decades uh, establishing and maintaining a vineyard there. So uh, we believe it is also possible, or at least one potential explanation, that some of the graves identified outside of the Penn Park Cemetery represent these post-emancipation African-American families. And now uh, I'm going to pass it on to Tom. Well, thank you, Ben and Jeff, for inviting me. You all have been very um, involved in this work, and I'm just kind of coming into it. You said COVID got in the way of your work. Well, I started in the middle of COVID here as the executive director. So if you go to my first slide, um, a lot of my background and experience um, I gained uh, working at Montpelier, uh, James Madison's Montpelier in Orange, Virginia. And uh, I wore many hats um, at Montpelier in a nonprofit museum world. That's what many people do. So I was an archaeologist, historian, curator. Um, by the time I left there, I was the director of operations, um, making sure everything was working correctly. And as they used to joke on me, I knew where all the bodies were buried because um, I did a lot of work on the cemeteries too, at the Madison Family Cemetery. And this particular picture is the Montpelier Slave Cemetery. This was a picture taken by Matthew Reeves, who I've worked with for many years and I consider a friend. Um, and this was part of our 2007 slave descendants reunion. Um, and this is just kind of one example of many things that I worked on. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, from both archaeological surveys, similar to what I showed there with the cemetery, um, working on the Gilmore cabin, which is a freedman's cabin on the property. Um, I was in charge of coordinating the 2007 Slave Descendants Reunion, um, and then with 2010, uh, we put together a, uh, the restoration and a, an exhibit uh, for the 1910 Montpelier Train Depot. Um, the exhibit was called In the Time of Segregation, and you can see in this image, um, it was a segregated uh, Southern Railway train depot that the DuPont family put up on uh, the railroad right there on their property. Um, and it has the white waiting room and the colored waiting room. Um, and in everything that we did at Montpelier, um, going back many years, and as archaeologists, uh, we were excavating in many ways the work of the enslaved community at Montpelier. When you, know, when you say James Madison planted this in his fields, well, he didn't actually do that. Um, he had other people who did that. So we definitely take into consideration this enslaved community. You go to the next slide. Um, and many of you may have seen recently with Montpelier and the Washington Post opinion article, and they've just actually come out to say that the uh, board of directors and the descendant community there um, um, have agreed to a shared structured way in which they are going to manage the property moving forward. Um, and it's after many years of work um, that is trying to find a more perfect union between, you know, the foundation for um, a place of enslavement uh, that has James Madison as the father of the Constitution, um, but also very, um, very forward looking to include the descendant community in everything that they do. And, you know, you might look at, you know, us here in the sense, you know, we're three uh, white middle aged guys speaking about an enslaved site. 
Um, but at the same time, um, we want to recognize and commemorate this ground and realize the importance of that on a professional level. Um, and I've been in that situation many times before with the work I've done in Montpelier, um, numerous projects where without the help of the descendant community that you would not be able to tell the whole history, tell the whole story. Um, and it's unfortunate that in many cases, black history has been ignored or just completely unwritten. Um, and it's left out of the dominant narratives and forgotten. Um, but we can all work to rectify this. And I see the Penn Park Cemetery project with the work that's been done so far in terms of understanding the, the background and the findings and the science and how that tells us what we have there. Um, we have an opportunity kind of to look at this um, and understand that as they did at Montpelier, a full participation from the descendant community as equal partners and contributors to the work of interpreting this and commemorating this, um, that that's very important. Um, in the next slide. So, you know, coming back full circle to Charlottesville and Albemarle, uh, we have seen some similar collaborative partnerships form to address issues of equality um, and how we remember and memorialize history in our public landscapes. Uh, so Albemarle County with their community driven and public engagement um, process that led to the removal of the at ready statue at the county courthouse. Um, the Monacan and Shoshone tribes, uh, Native American input, input regarding Lewis and Clark statues. Um, recent work by the city of Charlottesville um, to create a descendant community group um, to decide on how best to memorialize the slave auction block at the uh, court square. Um, and you know, also UVA's memorial to enslaved laborers and the descendants of enslaved communities at the University of Virginia and their continued work to find the names and histories of these people and, and honor their memory. Um, in the next slide. And I'll come back to Montpelier a little bit. And this was after I'd actually left and, and went off to another job, but they did some amazing work there. Um, and I think it's a prime example of what we can do moving forward with looking at Penn Park. Um, in 2019, um, they received a grant and did a great deal of work in creating this uh, rubric, uh, engaging descendant communities in the interpretation of slavery at museums and historic sites, a rubric of best practices established by the National Summit on Teaching Slavery. And I wanted to just dis define what in the rubric it says is a descendant community. In its most fundamental form, a descendant community is a group of people whose ancestors were enslaved at a particular site, but it can transcend that limited definition. A descendant community can include those whose ancestors were enslaved, not only at a particular site, but also throughout the surrounding region, reflecting the fact that family ties often cross plantation boundaries. And I've actually just thought when you were mentioning the Hotop workers possibly being buried outside if they also maybe had a connection to the other people who were mm -hmm. buried outside the wall too. And that was why they wanted to be buried there, even if it wasn't an unmarked grave. Um, but a descendant community can also welcome those who feel connected to the work the institution is doing, whether or not they know of a genealogical connection. And that the rubric goes on to say, engaging descendants of enslaved communities forms a critical component um, you empower these descendant voices to challenge the public to consider their point of view. Um, and until very recently, we have seen this point of view marginalized from our dominant historical narratives offered in classrooms, textbooks, museums, and historic sites. So simply beyond gaining historical information, uh, information institutions work respectfully with descendants to forge those connections that are critical to the work. Um, you can, next slide. So I kind of looked at what is a descendant, but I also am curious what is, you know, what is a cemetery? So there's a way in which you can look at cemeteries. And I did a great deal of research on the Madison Family Cemetery at Montpelier. I wrote my master's thesis on it. And my, my, my people who were responsible for it said, just you got a master's thesis, you're trying to write a PhD, stop. Um, so but I use this definition. So a cemetery is a community of the dead, created, maintained, and preserved by the community of the living. So this opens up many ways in which we can view historic cemeteries. Um, in the case of Penn Park, 
What we see is that the owners of the property marked their graves with tombstones. They were enclosed within their burial grounds within the brick or the stone or the wrought iron walls. And they also controlled not only the spaces within the walls, but those outside of the walls where the enslaved were located, where they were directed properly to bury their dead. Um, there's not, it's probably not hard to think that the reason these burials are here is because of the folks who own the property, who ran this property, who controlled these people's lives, who also controlled them in death. Um, and they were outside of the cemetery or outside of the formal white cemetery. They were unmarked and until recently hidden from history. Um, and this is how the past community of the living shaped that landscape. It shaped their memory of the dead, how their own family members and how of those of the enslaved. But now in the present, you know, we are also a part of that definition. We are a community of the living who are looking at this cemetery now. And we can create, and we can maintain, and we can preserve a, a completely new landscape here um, that can memorialize and that remembers um, these forgotten graves and attempts to find and tell their stories. So what we can do to, what, what can we do to move this project forward? Next slide. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of different opportunities here in terms of what we can look at. We'd love to look at genealogical and historical research to uncover the descendant communities associated with Penn Park. And I have a, a picture here of Shelley Murphy, who's a the lead researcher for the uh, Memorial to Enslave Laborers at UVA. Um, and she's also our, uh, one of my board members at the Historical Society, um, to be completely transparent. Um, and they detailed, you know, Black families that are possibly associated with the UVA laborers, but in many ways, as we see from the definition of a descendant community, there was lots of overlap, um, lots of uh, possibilities of the fact that what they're working on there could easily uncover information that could help us out in looking at Penn Park. Um, I started out as an archeologist and I love the idea, the possibility of looking at, still continuing to think through of ground truthing the GPR data um, with so secondary kind of excavations to uncover the burials, but also looking at that as an opportunity to connect with the descendant community. Um, there's been great work in public archaeology. I come back to Montpelier just because, well, it's kind of a first love. Um, but Matt Reeves at, at Montpelier has been using archaeology in a public forum to bring in the descendant community and actually have those kind of um, very important interactions um, with, I guess, yeah, next slide, actually. There you go. Um, so bringing them into the descendant, uh, bringing them into the archaeological work and having them really touch it. And this is actually uh, Joe McGill, who's a um, Google search him. I won't get involved in the, telling them more of that. Um, but he's a great guy. Um, and then continuing with oral history and public outreach. Um, and as Shelley has been doing with the, the slave descendants, the enslaved laborers descendants at UVA, not only reaching out to the black descendants, but also the white owners too. Um, and she's been very, you know, interested in, in how that is, um, that has transpired, that she has actually made some context that has opened up doors and opened up avenues of research. Um, so there's amazing possibilities. And to get a little bit into what we've kind of figured out with Penn Park, um, next slide, um, or maybe not. Yeah. Okay. Um, Mary Craven, um, who was one of the folks buried in oh, the cemetery. You can uh, go past, I believe we have those. Keep going, keep going, keep going. So the chancery record, two more. Yeah, that's that. yeah, that's that. Two more, two more. Oh, man, keep going. Presented. Nope, I must have okay. removed it. Not My a bad. problem. Um, so Mary Craven in her will um, indicated that there was a carpenter named Ned. Um, who was an enslaved individual that was owned by the Craven family. And there was also indications uh, from the work at UVA that in 1860, a Ned uh, was hired to do work at UVA. Um, so very interesting possibility of how this Ned Gibbons that we know of may also be 
Um, the same Ned that is mentioned in the Will book, who was the carpenter, and he may actually maybe even be buried at Penn Park. It's hard to say. In fact, the evidence suggests that he is uh, John Crabe, could be a son of John uh, Crabe. So I, I Shelley shared some additional information. Mm -hmm. So the, yeah, some pieces are falling into place. So even a, another complexity to understanding the role of separation and segregation of burial spaces, but even within close proximity of you know, having your own blood buried outside the wall of your family cemetery, which that's an interesting point of view. Um, but then also looking at all kinds of different records. And um, Shelley Murphy has gotten into a lot of this in terms of um, the brick wall that genealogists hit when they go back and try to understand, you know, African-American history and African-American genealogy. But there's been great strides and great work that has been done to help uncover those things, uh, to be able to pull together documents, court records, wills, deeds, chancery suits, letters, census records, birth, marriage, death records, you know, all the different tried and true pieces of that historians have used for years, but may not have looked at from the perspective that we want to look at in terms of telling a whole history. Um, and just to try to bring the past to life and to tell the stories of um, these forgotten folks. And uh, I think that's uh, something that I'm very excited about being involved in and, and look forward to continue working on this. So and I didn't really have a conclusion or a wrap up, but. Uh, okay, well, maybe now we can have some questions. Great. Okay, so I've written down some of them. Go to us. It's probably some of them are pretty. Uh, images of us. So people good. know we're human. So you may have already answered this, but you, but it has a different slant <coughs> on it. But somebody wants to know how can Virginia allow more research into the African American community during slavery? For example, UVA UVA took a while to include slave history. I, I guess their question is how can Virginia go about some of the things that you mentioned? The University of Virginia or Virginia as a whole? Um, Virginia. It just says Virginia. How can that open up? And uh, any suggestions on how that can I think, take you know, place? I, I, I mean, just for me taking my notes as far as um, um, you know, being the city employee here and, and the Penn Park being a city property, um, that it is a something to be addressed on a a site by site issue. And I think what, what Tom laid out in how they approached um, uh, Montpelier offers uh, some guidelines, but it really does come down to resources and, and, and time and effort. And uh, to, you know, even just to take a site like Penn Park and to, you know, we have a uh, 280 acres left of a, of a former uh, estate plantation uh, that we know was worked by enslaved people. Just to tell the story of that site, um, maybe that's use that as a sort of mm -hmm. place to answer the question from in that context. Yeah, that could definitely be a place in which I mean, it, it, particularly in Charlottesville and, and the, the overlapping of history in many ways in terms of how you can come at it. Um, you know, I think it's also interesting to think of Penn Park as a city property that was part of a plantation. Um, and then to also think of the other properties that made up Charlottesville that was then divided out, but those were places of enslavement, those were where plantations were located. Um, and I come back to Montpelier in that regards, just to simply say, you know, at least as an archaeologist or as a historian working there, that was always front and center in how we were telling those stories. Um, now, I think in many ways how it's become more a part of the narrative as opposed to a separate part of it. You know, and, and you take the tour of one thing and then you take the black history tours. It's, there was still a segregation of how you told the history. Um, but I think you need to combine those. And I think moving forward, there's some important ways that we can do that. I, I would also add to uh, what Jeff and Thomas said is that uh, this information, this history is not restricted information and in that um, I, I would encourage anyone who is interested in finding out more about their own family history or broadly about a locality or a region to do the research yourself. Um, 
Uh, most public records are accessible uh, through courthouses, through libraries. There are uh, knowledgeable people in uh, organizations and entities such as TOMS or the Historical Society that uh, can help you find resources and point you in the right direction. And um, there are also organizations, uh, the Central Virginia uh, History Researchers that meet uh, once a month in uh, the Jefferson School in Charlottesville. Uh, they are a fantastic organization to become a member of, and they have regular presentations and very knowledgeable people there uh, who are not professional historians, but are uh, uh, extremely knowledgeable and uh, about local history and would be more than willing to point you in the right direction and get you involved in, and, and make it become a passion. So I, I would encourage uh, the, the questioner that it, to, to really try and become uh, more involved yourself and, and, and that would be to anyone, of course. Um, and here's some smaller questions. Uh, one of them, uh, I think they probably didn't uh, hear the beginning, but what were the names of the slave owners that once owned Penhart? So who were the uh, slave owners? Well, we know of you know, certainly the Gilmers and the Cravens. Um, there were names, uh, families in between, a little uncertain of when someone would, like when the... Um, Gilmer family uh, no longer possessed it. Uh, someone else did, but that they lived there. So you know, the ownership and occupation of the site uh, uh, can be two different things. Or for example, we know Craven owned other property. So when you have a, a slave census that might say 45 individuals on it, uh, were they all at Penn Park? So that's where sometimes the, the record becomes um, a little bit tricky to, to, to interpret what exactly does this mean. Um, but uh, the other thing I would say is that, um, and this is something Shelley Murphy told me, and she, she said it in a presentation she gave earlier this year, that only about 15% of emancipated slaves took the names of, of the people, uh, you know, the that had owned them. Mm -hmm. And I really surprised me. So she said, so, you know, this, well, just look for the people that are named, you know, so-and-so. She said that that's not your best clue. She's the best clue. And this is what I think is most promising is that the 1850s census is when we started to see people listed by name in a household and then 1860 census and 1870. So it's taking that 1860 census and then laying down next to it, the 1870 census and you, you see, you know, the names of the people that live close to each other. And then you go to 1870 and now there's there's 20 households in between and a lot of them are, are black households. Um, and that's what Shelley had said is that, you know, these people didn't go far. Um, so that's a place to look for some clues and some names. Um, and, and again, that's uh, it's just something that, that Tom is, is working on this summer and, and we're collaborating on is, is to get an article into the Almore County Historical or the Almore Charlottesville Historical Society's magazine and to begin to get some of these uh, stories out, some of these names out. Uh, Tom has an intern that'll be working to, to kind of be our 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 inventory. Uh, try to help person. Jeff out. Yeah, try to just begin with several, together. you know, all right, here's a name, here's a name, here's a name, and how does it fit? So we have lots of bits and pieces um, I would say anybody out there that just loves puzzles and detective stories, that's what this is. It really is trying to take a name from one generation to the next and seeing if there's a connection. And, uh, uh, but I, we hopefully will get those names out there and maybe that, that uh, Robert's make a note of that. So, so uh, somebody wants to know, uh, have you ever considered doing DNA analysis? So that would mean you'd have to... Uh, Ben's got that one. We talk about it a lot. Um, for this particular project, there, there was never any intention to uh, excavate graves or to uh, uh, exhume human remains. But we anticipate the questions. So. <laughs> yeah. um, but um, 
uh, one, one of the things which is, is uh, difficult, as I understand it, is recovering uh, substantial DNA from human remains to get uh, uh, valid information. Um, in uh, Albemarle County soils, which are highly acidic, uh, organic remains do not preserve well over time. Um, but there could potentially be uh, some information that can be obtained. Uh, I, I'm not a, a DNA scientist, and, and I know that uh, uh, this, this science advances by leaps and bounds uh, almost every year. Uh, but um, that, that there is also an ethical issue there. Um, uh, I know uh, that I would not personally want to excavate human remains. Um, and I think uh, you would have to certainly have buy-in and support from community, uh, in this case, a descendant community uh, to do that. And I think you would want to spell out uh, very specifically what the goals were of that study and uh, certainly uh, be advised by someone in the scientific community who is an expert in that and can advise along the way what specifically can be obtained from uh, this type of DNA information and, and what it will get you. Um, you know, will it get you names of individuals? Probably not. Uh, will it get you uh, uh, family groups? Possibly. So, um, and, and as I understand it, uh, DNA information is just sort of the, the front end of it. Uh, you would, to, to tie that DNA information to local or regional families, you would need uh, DNA from um, uh, individuals who, who volunteered that. Uh, so it's a very complicated and um, uh, ethically uh, challenging uh, process, but something uh, that can be done with uh, the right support and the right uh, people in place. Okay, so um, here's a, another one. Has consideration been given about the adjourning property of the Free State, which is very close to Penn Park, and uh, where their graves may be in relationship, if there's any relationship between the two cemeteries, Free State and Penn Park? Um, I don't know of any direct relationship. I know uh, that the Gilmer and Cravens probably knew uh, the residents at Dunlora, I believe that the uh, historic plantation property that was right adjacent to Free State uh, was Dunlora. Um, and uh, I believe there is a family connection between the uh, uh, African American individuals who were living and residing at Free State, a very small uh, African American, free African American community that dates to the very late 18th century. Um, and so I know there is a connection with families uh, from the Dunlora enslaved population, uh, but I don't know of any uh, direct connection to uh, Penn Park and the Gilmer family, although there may be. Okay. Uh, so here's another one. Were emancipated slaves buried in their own cemeteries as a rule post-emancipation? So after emancipation, were they buried? Would these graves all be during slavery, uh, antebellum, all graves that you've discovered, or do you think some of them could have been after emancipation? Well, I think the, the possibility that was brought up in the talk about the African-American laborers for the Hotops mm -hmm. um, post-emancipation, um, if they had a possible family connection to individuals who had died during slavery and had been buried um, in these unmarked graves outside of the cemetery walls, and there could be an interesting overlap there historically. Um, but there's, I don't, I don't think there's any one answer to that question. I mean, there was multiple different, uh, at least in terms of different cemeteries that I've looked at and studied, um, you have some cemeteries that have their basis in um, a, an enslaved community that was on a plantation and as the free community continued to live in that area, they would continue to utilize that cemetery. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a little bit, it's kind of like saying with, you said earlier in the, with, there's no one-to-one -one correlation between how um, these cemeteries are laid out in Virginia. 
I, I also think if you if you look at uh, a map of the GPR identified graves, uh, there may be a strong argument in in my opinion uh, as to the location of uh, the graves outside of the hoe top section that strongly suggests that those might be individuals who were interred post-emancipation because the Hotops did not, if I'm correct, own and uh, reside on the property until post-emancipation period, 1866. So, uh, you know, looking at the spatial arrangement of graves, there are a number of graves that are east of and adjacent to the Hotop section. And um, that is certainly a strong hypothesis. And the, the archaeology geek in me would say, like, if you did an excavation that revealed the, the grave um, uh, shaft and you had any indications of overlap mm -hmm. where there was maybe forgotten memory of where burials were, but or if you did a complete excavation and realized there is no overlap, mm -hmm. there's either they're very close in you know, time period when those burials occurred, so they remembered where one was, or there's a strong memory and or maybe a way in which they were marked that has no longer been yeah, that's probably know, a wooden marker of some yeah. sort. Um, but I think that's interesting, at least in terms of the other cemeteries that I've worked on, the realization that even within the Madison Family Cemetery, there were overlapping graves where, you know, when they dug a later grave over an earlier grave, um, that indicates something in terms of the memory. Yeah. It's something, you know, it's I think something Ben is and, and Steve Thompson always said, you know, the, the earth wants to be flat, you know, and so the, the top of the hills are, you know, washing down. And so this is on the side of a hill. And, and so maybe there were stones there. And as, as the, the, that soil moved away, those stones fell over and then they just became field stones for the crater. Well, I've so seen other anything pictures, there, I think right? it was in 1976, that the, the white, the, the Craven, the Gilmer, and the Hotop were completely like renovated or restored? Uh, the, the Gilmer section was uh, for the bicentennial. Uh, do, mm -hmm. Dr. Gilmer was uh, in, the, in the Continental Army. He was uh, Jefferson's um, yeah. Uh, personal uh, uh, lieutenant. Yeah, so so with the, a, a wall made of yeah. field stones mm -hmm. surrounding that cemetery. I didn't, wouldn't surprise me if somebody may have come along and picked up field stones. It's a very right. Exactly. Off the wall. exactly. Um, so if there was a marker of any sort or something that marked a location, Okay, so maybe just a few more. Um, let's see. Is there a pattern to where the head of the deceased were located? Would you know, would that information just be kind of lost to them? It, it, in typical uh, Christian burials, uh, generally the head faces the east, as I understand it. And so the east west orientation, uh, uh, the head would be at the west and the feet would be at the east. Okay. The idea of waking up and yeah, yeah. seeing the sunrise. Yeah. The metaphor of the rising sun um, in a Christian burial. The sun coming over the southwest mountains is beautiful every morning and it's right there. Yeah. It is. Um, so what are the next, you may have already talked about this, but um, somebody wants to know what are the next steps in the project? So the next steps, and I, you know, just, when I'll say it, and I know in some of the images, uh, uh, and, and this is you and I would met talking about this. There's a lot of, of groundhog activity out there. So in some of the images, it looked like uh, something had been dug, and it was. Um, um, it, it, we did no excavation at all. Uh, in fact, it, it's actually a little alarming out there uh, when you see even inside. I think the Craven section. It's like I'm surprised. You don't see things coming up and out of that hole. Uh, but the um, when Ben and and I were out there last July, and and, and you know the findings of the, the GPR crew, you know the guy was going, here's one, here's one, and it became very clear. In fact, Ben even pulled me aside, and said, I think I think there is no question. There's a lot more here. And remember, we we were talking when we initially spoke. I said, I think I I might see seven or eight. I think he said maybe eight to 10. So when they were out there talking, you know, more than 20 and then ultimately more, possibly more than 40, that kind of floored us. And, and Ben, you know, that day he pulled me aside. And he says, I don't, I think we know that this is a burial site. I think we can make some very strong assumptions. I think we have 
from the, and it's that aerial photo from the 30s. It shows that area for whatever reason has not been disturbed. Um, and he said, I think that we, have, we know enough to say this area should not be disturbed further. Um, and we went to, I, I, well, both Ben and I went and spoke to city council and, and with the recommendation that you could take these next steps to, to be absolutely certain, uh, you know, that's that pulling away the soil to determine these are actual grave shafts, um, but that we didn't think that was necessary. And in order to, 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 to establish that this was a burial site and that we really would like to, and this is what you know, came directly from city council was, um, um, before you do anything else, let's see if we can uh, make that contact with that, with possible descendants and have them involved, like at, at Mount Hillier, have them involved in what happens there next. Um, so right now it is a place that will not be disturbed. Um, and uh, I mean, you know, it might be, uh, maybe we put something up that says, you know, within this area, you know, is a human burial site, something, but not, we really want to, whatever next steps happen at the site are going to happen with, with the Senate. Next steps immediately are, and, and I, you know, I'll say this, this is just wearing one of many hats I wear for the city, and, and, and it's, and it's a, it's a rather small hat. So, uh, you know, the resources <laughs> for me to do uh, this level of research, um, and it, it's going to take, uh, it might take a couple years. Uh, and our goal this summer is is to really, you know, and I, I, I know people say, have you talked to Sam Taller? Have you talked to Shelly Murphy? Have you talked to Maureen Spokes? Yes. Uh, but there's others out there that could help us. And to, to feed us that information that we can begin to organize an inventory and get a sense of what we have and if there are uh, descendants that we can reach out to. So it's, 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 we're going to do the research that we can. But I, I gotta say, in, I think it's also yeah. taking advantage of what is going on locally, mm -hmm. also with uh, what is UVA, what UVA has been doing with right. the memorial and the descendant research, and and to put the names on the memorial. Um, so there's a very important focus on the genealogical side of that and understanding those people. Um, but then also with the, the slave descendants uh, involved in the uh, slave auction mm -hmm. block that is a little bit more inclusive in the sense of, you know, the definition I used of a descendant, right. you could find right. a genealogical connection or you could consider yourself a part of that community that has a say and in, in either way, it's just as important. Um, and I thought like an earlier slide that you put up of when you had all the burials in the wall within the Craven and the Gilmer and the Hotops, and we even know the names of the people who own the property in between them. And we have the histories of those people in those walls going back decades. And then you have, you know, 40 or 50 graves here, and then you have another 40 or 50 year graves. Your work uncovered, you know, the fact that this cemetery is double in size, but we only still know half the history. Right. And I think is it's it's a very poignant thing to think about. It's kind of profound, and particularly like trying to understand that history. I think it's very important. So, the historical society's interest in doing anything we can to participate and gather that information. One one of the uh, more important things, in my opinion, is uh, commemoration or memorialization of the Penn Park uh, Cemetery. Uh, it is a very it can be and should be a very powerful meaningful um, memorial. Uh, and if you have ever been to the University of Virginia uh, enslaved burial ground, they, until the pandemic, they had an annual uh, memorial and commemoration event, commemorative event, uh, which was very moving. And um, so having some type of uh, memorial there in whatever form it takes, uh, can be a very uh, powerful thing for the for the living community. Yeah, it's and it's just I'm you know really intrigued again by what you said about what Montpelier did. I mean, we have here a uh, 280 acres left of, of what had been this large place. It is a um, you know it's a city park. And there's a lot goes on there. It gets used in a lot of ways. The opportunity to present uh, a fuller history 
of a site is right here, right now. And now, I mean, I, I'm not the person who'll make that decision, but that opportunity is here. Uh, you know, we've even, you know, some of the speculation been, all right, well, where did these folks live? Um, and so it, 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 and I can't, I can't overstate what it was like standing out there with Ben that day and was like, and he did, he said, come here, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta ask you a question. It was just like, this like overwhelming of how many people were this wasn't eight to ten i just it still just was stood like a like a gut punch and and a tremendous amount of responsibility that i realized all right this is not you know this is not an unmarked grave and and you know you would asked about names just you know so one of the things that ben found in his research um uh, in 1804 uh where after george gilmer's death um uh, that he was auctioning off, um, I can't remember, I think it was like 40 or 50 people, but, you know, Mountain Fanny was one name, you know, uh, Ursuli, Richmond Fanny, Archer, Lucy, John, Caesar's son. So we have some names. Um, and uh, I guess the, 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 what we really need to do is get these out some way that people can, you know, here's what we know, have a bulletin board that allows folks to, to, say oh that triggers a thought but you know remember we're talking about um burials that may have occurred in the in in the 1780s so that's a long um i mean it's just a generation did we just go off no no i was just reading a comment oh sorry but you know i mean it's um we can answer questions as long as as, as you like um uh, if this is helpful and uh well, there's two more. Uh, two people have made comments, so I'll read, if you don't mind, the comments. Colleen, uh, she wants to say that she is one of the nine founding members of the descendants of the enslaved communities at the University of Virginia. So she's been listening to me. And then also we had a comment from uh, Lynn Rainville. Oh, we know her well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In 2000, she'd like to say in 2003, Lynette Strangstad, Strangstad right. published a study of this site and identified these unmarked depressions, and she suggested they were the burials of enslaved. Correct, and yeah. and yeah, and so that's the um, that was one of the citations, and then but where she there was like a reference to family lore. But I've found no one that that I've spoken with, you know, of the families that that was aware of that. Um, I've seen nothing in the old. Um, there's some old interviews actually at the historical society. Um, so, but needless to say, she was correct. Um, and, you know, I'll say also is uh, the the gentleman that was uh, the, the photo of uh, had the Clemson hat, you know, and so you know, mm -hmm. and my my son recently graduated graduated from Clemson, so go Tigers! But you know, he going into the South like that, and Clemson University was an enormous plantation of the Calhoun family, um, and just um, him sort of reflecting on you know how they were struggling to um, present that entire campus in its context and uh, and and remember he said yeah dad there's a, a a slave cemetery with uh possibly 120 slaves I said will that that place enslaved thousands you know so there's a lot more you know so that it is you know to that question that person was asking you know, how does the state of Virginia do it or how does how, how do we do it? How does a town do it? How does the city do it? How does Penn Park do it? It's a great question. And I, I guess what's, what's good is we're seeing places and entities and municipalities willing to, to struggle with that. And, um, but it's gonna take for this particular place, and this is just one, uh, we know of some other places in the city we're gonna be poking around and you know, it's gonna take uh, the community feeding information back to us and, you know, really, um, you know, reach out to me, reach out to Tom at the Historical Society. We have uh, Maddie back here who will be our, uh, an expert on Penn Cemetery and by the end of the summer. Um, so really, this is a, an opportunity for collaboration and, um, and we're looking for help. Oh, 
Okay, well, thank you so much. Um, I really want to thank you for coming today. This has been very interesting, and I know a lot of people have enjoyed it. Um, can you put the slide up? Um, I couldn't get to all the questions. There were so many. So we are going to uh, put up their contact information of our panel. If you want to get in touch with them, if you have more questions and you'd like to talk, or if you have some leads and you want to uh, provide those, um, I know they would be very welcome to get those. So um, I want to thank also the friends of the library for their generous support in making all of our programs possible. And um, I want to also thank Evan Stankovics because he's been our technology person here, uh, forwarding all the slides and videos. He he's always, always does a great job. And I also want to thank all of you for joining us. Um, this has been a wonderful program. So have a wonderful evening. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Maureen, thank you, thank you, thank you.